You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, which can be found on our website at treyerwilderness.com and also on iTunes. Welcome to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where we are homesteading traditionally 100% off-grid today and offering preparedness and survival tips for tomorrow. Here's your host, Tammy Treyer. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me here at Mountain Woman Radio. It is another beautiful day here in northern Idaho. I say that all the time, but I find beauty in everything, but it is a gorgeous day. It is sunny, and uh, the mountain boy and I just came back from a nice walk, and my health is improving. I've been going to a um, extreme mus- muscle therapist, and she has been greatly helping me to remove the toxins from my body, so I am progressively getting better health and uh, just taking one day at a time here and just so thrilled with all the doors that God is opening for us. We have all kinds of things on the horizons. Um, Again, you can join us um, on our website at treyerwilderness.com and stay tuned. We have Treyer Wilderness Academy coming soon. We have lots of classes forming and are really excited to bring them uh, to the front and I am working on a couple of books here and finishing up my book so uh, things are good and I am really blessed today to have a really great guest on a a good friend and uh, he has a really awesome ministry and I have Reese Crane joining me today. He is a certified Christian counselor, and he has some amazing programs that I know will reach many of you and be an aid to many of you, and if not yourself, others. And we hope that today you will be sure to uh, share this podcast with other people. This is uh, a topic that a lot of people don't want to talk about. They push under the rug, and really it's something that needs to be addressed. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Reese Crane and he can share the details. Reese, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tammy. It's really good to be here. I'm, um, I'm so glad to have you and you have such an awesome ministry and I would just love to give you the floor and let you share all about yourself, your story and, and what it is that you do. Well, as you said, I am a certified Christian counselor. Um, I got my bachelor's degree actually not too long ago, um, kind of in the prime of my life at age 50 right now, but I felt there was a need uh, because of my past experience. Um, I have a a long history of being addicted to pornography, and I have run into so many people, male and female, who have expressed to me ever since I, you know, kind of came out with all this news that I had been addicted for so long, um, they were able to share with me albeit in secret, because nobody really likes to just come out and put a front-page headline out that they're addicted to pornography. But they uh, would approach me uh, and ask me if I could help them. And the more that that was happening, the more I realized that there was a need to really create some type of gathering or ministry uh, in my hometown back here in, in, uh, in the east, in Pennsylvania. And so I began to do that. Uh, where it all started was probably when I was 11 or 12 years old, and I became aware of pornography through uh, Playboy's um, Penthouse, you know, the kind of magazines that were out in the 60s, 70s, yeah. and we would we would find them at uh, trash heaps um, behind Kmart's and things like that, right. and uh, it was something that was just kind of like handed down through the generations, if you will, you know, <laughs> kids that were older than me. Um, that you would be riding bikes with, they would tell you, hey, guess what we found? And and you'd go find it, and then you'd tell kids that were younger than you because it was secretive. 
Uh, it was funny in a way, but you didn't really realize what was happening to you at the time. You were being drawn into something quite a bit darker than you would ever realize. Yeah. And, and so we would look at these magazines. Uh, as time went on and I grew older, of course, uh, the, the advent of video uh, became available in every home. Yeah. And a friend of mine from high school whose uh, father had a stack of pornographic videos said he was going to bring a couple over one day. And uh, so we had a sleepover at my house and we ended up watching these videos and I got pulled deeper into it. Uh, of course, utilizing all of this mental imagery through my life, uh, you know, when the hormones start raging, you discover about yourself um, and you discover your sexuality and you start to self gratify when you're looking at this imagery, uh, whether it's just in your head or whether you see it in the magazines or in the video. Um, so I spent a lot of my life then, you know, self gratifying um, to this mental pornographic imagery. I then, you know, obviously down the road, I went into the military for three years and I was stationed over in Germany where there was, or there were pornographic theaters pretty much on every corner. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would visit those or I would rent videos on uh, our army post yeah. that were pornographic. And I did not realize just how drawn in I was, just how addicted I was to the need for pornography and the need for self-gratification. Um, and as time went on, of course, then you have the advent of the Internet showing up in everybody's household around, uh, oh, I don't know what, the early to mid-90s, yeah. and uh, began to find that all of these pornographic video companies were starting to put videos online. Uh, you weren't able to see them very easy because back in the 90s when you were on the Internet, it was extremely slow. Yeah. Um, so it started out with just still photos and things that you could get. Um, and it was easier then because then if you were on the verge of getting caught by your parents or by your wife, you could easily turn it off. You know, it wasn't something on the television that you had to scramble to get to the video player or, uh, you know, a magazine that you had to somehow hide yeah. some way. Um, you know, now it was very, very easy to hide your addiction, and uh, and people are watching it all over the place. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, before, but it is everywhere now. Yeah. It is it is a global phenomenon and multiple billions of dollars yeah. uh, industry, yeah. and it is it is truly causing so much brokenness. The yeah. people who are acting, the people who were acting in the professional pornographic movies of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they're starting to come out now with their testimonies of how broken their life was. Mm -hmm. And we're also finding out so much else about what pornographic industry is fueling in a, in a global way. Um, something I know that I've been researching for the past few months has been the fact that pornography, sexual abuse in the home, whether it be uh, against children or uh, spousal abuse or partner abuse, um, prostitution, sexual exploitation as it relates to, um, you know, finding wayward teenagers, especially wayward girls mm -hmm. who don't really have a promise of anything in these uh, hunters that come out and they seek these young girls and they say, hey, I can give you money if you'll come model for me. Um, and then they find out as soon as they get into that environment that um, they actually owe them money and the way that they can pay off the debt that they owe them for all of this modeling expense they put them through um, is to actually do pornographic scenes and movies. And it is, it is amazing, Tammy, how much this has spread across the globe. And what I believe in my heart is that pornography is the fuel to this fire. It's, uh, if we can stop the pornography use and cut down the demand for the pornography use, we can start to see this really lose a lot of steam. Yeah. It's something that people just do not want to give up because they are so addicted to feeling good, yeah. um, to self-gratifying to it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Some people's marriages are falling apart all around me right now. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, I mean, we have success stories too. Don't get me wrong. I said, I don't want to just yeah. make everybody <laughs> think that this is just negative or anything. But what it's doing to marriages is killing them. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing to individuals is it's taking their mind and it is physically rearranging their mind and their reward center is exploding with the need for more of that feeling, more of that gratification, more of that dopamine release in their brain. Mm -hmm. And what is happening up front, this is, this is actually stuff they find out that uh, those who are addicted to pornography um, have the same physical uh, aspects of their brain changing as those who are on heroin or crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. They're finding that up front in their brain, uh, they're finding that their reasoning center up in front, the prefrontal cortex, they call it, or the frontal lobe area, actually shrinks the more they give themselves to uh, pornographic imagery, the more they give themselves to that self-gratification and what happens with the actual chemical releases in their brain. Um, how many times have you seen or known someone or even heard about someone, you, you look at them maybe like a, a heroin addict or an alcoholic or somebody who is addicted to other substances and you look at them and you ask them the question, don't you know what you're doing? You, you present to them everything around them and you say, you're losing everything because of this addiction that you have. Don't you understand? But the answer to that, Tammy, is no, they don't, they don't yeah. because they are losing their ability to reason because that portion of their brain is shrinking wow. while the reward center is on fire demanding that they have this feeling again. And yeah. it's just like any other uh, addiction out there that you need more to get the same feeling that you had yesterday. So you have to go deeper and deeper, and especially with pornography, yeah. it causes you to go more extreme. And that's that's what's really crazy. I mean, with substance abuse, you use more and more and more of it, and you kind of knock yourself out. Right. With pornography, with pornography, yeah. it is something completely different. You go into this extreme area of imagery, which starts to get involved with things like uh, child pornography, which is huge and it's on the rise, oh. but it makes sense to somebody who has been addicted to porn. Yeah. It makes just as much sense to me for somebody to go into child pornography because it's just the next level oh. of the extreme imagery that their mind is demanding, that their brain is demanding. Bestiality, things that we don't like to talk about, and everybody backs off and they're like, oh, I don't want to think about it. Okay. It is normal to somebody who is a pornography addict wow. because it is just the next level and the need for more extreme imagery. Wow. Wow, that's really eye-opening, Reese, because, you know, you think about it and, and you know, most people think of it as a dirty thing. And, you know, it, it doesn't start out that way for a lot of these young kids. Like you said, they are just surrounded by good-looking girls and, you know, the level of modesty in today's society has uh, certainly subsided. You know, where, where it used to be that you had a, a T-shirt that was at your neck, it's now at your belly button. You know, it's just the, 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 right. so the visual imagery alone just in society today is so hard for these young kids. And, and also the struggle, like you had mentioned too, with the girls, you know, uh, being preyed upon, you know, there, uh, there's a lot of girls out there looking for uh, self-worth and, you know, they're trying to compete and keep up with uh, the image that our society puts as normal with the models and everything. And, and so they're seeking, you know, comfort and, and, and they're getting it in the wrong places when these predators, you know, come to them. So it's really scary. It's really scary to... Um, really think about it in that depth when you when you talked about uh, the different levels and how that becomes normal and and when you say that it makes total right. sense but you know when you don't really think right. about it in society this is one of those things that society just pushes aside and doesn't think about you know if you're not involved in it you don't think about it and and even for some of those that do have people involved in it they turn their back on it because they don't know how to help I imagine you know and right right exactly yeah, so it's... They, they don't. I mean... Go ahead. <laughs> some, some of the points that you touched on 
really falls into this whole concept of the normalization of sexuality. We have normalized it over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, certainly being sexual takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden, but the, the, the perversion of it, the prostitution of it all, and not, not just the, you know, the, the paid use for sex, but I'm just saying, I'm using that, yeah. uh, you know, kind of as an adverb or a verb, but the, the prostitution of it all, mm-hmm. um, how it has changed over the millennia and especially over the past 30 or 40 years. Yeah. One of the things that I've said is what one generation allows, the next one will fight for. Yeah. And we have found out that, you know, back in 1967, when there was the summer of love, you know, yeah. uh, all around the, the globe, you know, you had the, the, the beginnings of the Woodstock era, yeah. um, things that were going on at Berkeley and San Francisco, and they called it the summer of love. And you had, you know, these songs that were out around that time. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Right. Um, it was this sense of people were fighting back against something, uh, against a society that they felt was enslaving them. And so they fought back in, in ways that it wasn't just political or uh, or educational. They were fighting back in ways that they were just going for whatever felt good. They just wanted to feel good for once, you know? Mm-hmm. They didn't want people telling them what to do. And so next year is going to be 50 years. The Summer of Love happened in 1967. Mm-hmm. And it literally was a sexual revolution that took place. Yeah. And I remember... You know, I remember growing up, and 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 there were certain things that were kind of normal for me because of the dress at the time. But it is nothing like we see now, and it's coming at you on uh, at the Tiger Beat magazines worse than I have ever seen it in my entire life. And you're right, and, and and it's something that I don't fully comprehend or understand yeah. why it is that we look at this as something that we have to achieve. Hmm. why these young women look at it, but there's unfulfilled needs in all of our lives. And if we don't get in touch with that, what we really need to, to actually fulfill us, then we're going to accept the counterfeit of that. Hmm. And you're going to put yourself in a situation where you're saying, well, it, it, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what feels good to me. This is what's pleasurable to me. And you are told over and over and over again by a number of mainstream entities that that's what life is all about. It's to feel good. Right. It's to do what you want. It's not to let anybody put you in a box or let anybody put structure into your life. You know, it's like just do what you think feels good. And and I know, I, you know, I've been involved in social work in my life where I've seen the literal destruction of the family because yeah. of all this belief system it is starting to come out in the physical. Yeah. And, and that, oh, man, that is a whole other point out there of people with pornography addictions. Normally, normally they keep it in the realm of, of the mental, yeah. uh, of the emotional feeling and they'll self gratify, you know, in their basement on their computer or on their TV or something like that. Right. But now you have the sense of stepping out of the mental, stepping out of the emotional, stepping out of the secret and people are starting to take this to the next level and the need for, you know, the physical. Yeah. And you're finding rape is on the increase. You're, you're finding sexual abuse cases in the home are on the increase because one of the things that we have found with pornography addiction is it's coupled very easily with anger because yeah. there is so much expectation because of what you've seen in the pornographic industry, the fantasy level that you see in the pornographic industry, yeah. and the feeling um, you know, the, the orgasmic feeling that you have from self-gratification in the pornography industry. And now you're trying to take that into your regular uh, relationships, and it's not living up to it. Okay. You know, normal marriages don't live at a level that you see in a pornography movie, you know? Yeah. Like, it, when, you, when you're making love, when you're enjoying intimacy with each other, in, in, a, in a beautiful, covenant relationship with each other, It's not the kind of stuff that you see in the movie. It's just being able to share something wonderful together. And so people don't have that concept anymore. They're out there just doing whatever they want, and it's kind of like an entitlement to pleasure. That's another thing that I don't know if I coined that or not, but it's an entitlement to pleasure. People feel they, they want to feel good because they feel so oppressed by the man by, you know, the the business sector or their job and their career. And they're trying to do everything they can to make a few bucks, you know, so they can pay their bills. 
but they're so stressed out. This world is wound up so tight. Yes. And we're finding that pornography is one of the, you know, the greatest releases, you know, yeah. that, that men and women have found. And, and so it's, you know, it, it is, it is heart wrenching. It is heartbreaking. Uh, especially when you see your close friends and family going through breakups and divorce because somebody just won't give up their pornography addiction. Mm. Um, it, it, it just it just kills you. But at the same time, we know what the answer is. I mean, you and I know what the answer is. Yes, we do. That I would have never been able to change. I would have never been able to stop my addiction to pornography if it wouldn't have been for an encounter that I had with Jesus Christ. It just would not have happened. I was raised in a Christian home my whole life. My father and mother were missionaries. I knew everything that there was to know about the Bible. I knew everything that there was to know about God. Yeah. But it it was un, it wasn't until five years ago, I mean at age forty six, forty five, forty six years of age, yeah. five years ago when I finally had this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and I was mm -hmm. able to call God my father mm -hmm. that that changed everything. I wasn't yep. praying to God the judge because I always looked at him with the gavel on his hand. Right. I was able to like, and it and it was uncomfortable, Tammy. It was yeah. uncomfortable to call God Father. Yeah. Some people don't have that, and I and I'm thankful and glad that they don't have that. But for me, because I didn't have a really close relationship with my parents, yeah. um, for me to look and make that transfer onto God as Father was difficult for me. Yeah. And and I said I just have to do this. You know, yeah. I have to call him Father, and I'm going to fake it till I make it. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm going to believe in my heart that he truly wants to be a daddy to me. Yeah. And when I got that, I started to get my identity as a child of God, awesome. as a child of the one true loving Father, awesome. uh, and even accepted my position, kind of if you will, as royalty to be a prince. Yeah. And yeah. and a prince and a child of God has a different identity and they start doing things differently and they start thinking about their life differently. Yep. And once you get that identity and it can only come from father God, your creator, yep. once you get that identity, your purpose, your life, your perspective, everything changes and you can be a person that chooses not to sin. You can be a, a person that chooses not to be addicted and not to give yourself to that anymore. If people would only realize they had the choice, Tammy, yes. they truly do have the choice not to let this run their life. Yes. They can take the authority in Jesus Christ over this and win it and be completely healed, not manage your addiction. Yep. You don't have to manage your addiction for the rest of your life and say, hello, I'm Reese Crane. I'm an addict. Um, yep. Hello, Reese. Um, you literally can be healed by the love of the almighty God. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's so amazing and such an awesome testimony because that's, that's so true. And like go, going through my health journey and, and going through these struggles in our lives, you know, with what you've just expressed, you know, those moments make you really look at the rest of the world and wonder how other people are surviving if they don't know God, because Honestly, it's such a struggle sometimes to go through these things and to know oh, that we have yes. God on our side and that God is our rock. He's holding us up. He's he's working miracles that we can't even see happening yet. And, and, and to think that there are other people that are trying to get through these experiences in their lives on their own just makes me want to cry because life is hard. It's like you said, we are in such a weird state. Our society is in such a weird state. We are... Um, in a um, disposable society. Marriage doesn't matter to people anymore. It's a quick uh, signing a paper and, and moving on. And and watching TV, it's like you have to, like we haven't had TV for eight or nine years, but my son and I have just recently started watching a show called Lie to Me. It's an, I thought it was really awesome, and it is a good show, but it's really funny. He even said it too, that the more we watch it, the more colorful it gets. Everybody's sleeping with everybody. Nobody sleeps with the same person. Nobody values marriage. You know, there's just so much exploited sex and and drugs and it's really, it's really scary to know that that's what our young kids have to look at. You know, we can choose what we want to watch, you know, being off grid and not having a TV. But when you sit in front of the TV and your choices are slim and you're watching the stuff, it causes anger. It causes, you know, people don't realize that when they get hooked on shows and they get hooked on watching these things that it really does play bearing on 
how they behave and how they view things. Oh. And, and just, exactly. it's just, it's, it's like you said, it's just, everything is in the face and, you know, you never really gave much thought to all the things that you are discussing today, you know, the aspects of how things have progressed and how simple and easy it is to, you know, just sit in front of a computer screen, you know, this day and age and, and get your fill, you know, one of, I'm a big fan, right. I'm a big, big fan of, um, the, uh, Oh gosh, I just went blank. Um, Flywheel is one of the movies. Um, Fireproof, uh, Courageous. I can't think of the name of the um, producers, but they have amazing movies. And Fireproof was a really good one that dealt with the firemen with pornog dealing with pornography. And and it's just one of those things where you need to, you know, look for tools to help your family members to help yourself and to really hang on tight to God. And that's where I think you come into play very in a very large way today with what you offer. You have, he, uh, Reese has two different websites, the silent addiction.com and love beyond ourselves.org. And you'll be able to find those in the show notes and I'm sure we'll mention them again. I'll be sure to mention them at the end, but you know, Reese, I think that your ministry and what you are doing, you know, you've overcome and through the grace of God and through with God's help, you have overcome. And now it is your passion and, you know, God's will for you, obviously, by the way the doors have just flown open for you to be able to help other people down this path. Well, that's what I'm hoping happens. And uh, the funny thing is, um, a friend of mine who is a success story in this uh, his wife found him using porn and became extremely distrustful with him right. uh, to the point that they almost lost their marriage. Yeah. And if both of them hadn't have had uh, a sense of their their uh, their faith in Christ and their ability to kind of turn their life around and realize that they wanted each other more than um, than just the pleasures of life, they wanted something more that God was creating with them, right. um, they wouldn't have made it. Yeah. But... Uh, he works with me in this group, and um, we've talked to each other because, you know, we've we've done some other radio appearances where uh, we wanted to get the word out, and you think, oh, they're just going to come running to you. And, <laughs> and you think the phone calls are going to come in. You're, you're, you're not going to have enough time in the day to, you know, because you know what the statistics are. I have them on uh, my silent addiction website. We have a page just for stats, uh, okay. global stats, and it will overwhelm you. When you when you start to read that, um, but uh, but this this friend of mine and myself we um, <laughs> we we just sat back and we're like, where is everybody? Yeah. Come on, man, we have an answer. Don't you understand? <laughs> and then then you'd get an email about a week later, and they would want to say, hi, could we meet somewhere away from your meeting? I just want to talk to you. Yeah. And and they've worked themselves into being a hermit. Yep. Um, and in fact, the first, first few meetings I'm meeting in my home now <clears throat> because we, we needed some space, which is awesome. But, um, but we were meeting out in uh, a public arena okay. at, at a little restaurant and people were, they were, <laughs> they were, or they were, you're meeting out where there's other people around. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, really? What, what, um, do you, do you just talk about this stuff? And I'm, yeah, yeah, we talk. <laughs> and I told him, and I said, and I, and I told him this, I said, listen to me, focus in on me right now. Here's the deal. If you can't talk about this when other people are around, you're going to stay in the shadows of your sin. Yeah. And, and, you know, they were real hesitant. They wouldn't come out. They wouldn't come out. They wouldn't come out. And I make our meeting fun. I don't make them, when we get together, I, I make them fun. Look, you blew it. Okay. Ha ha. That's funny. But we can, we can still look at life as joy. Right. We can still look at life as having purpose. Yep. Everybody messes up. Yep. The only reason you, you messed up, it's just different than the way Tammy does it. Yeah. It's, it's different than the way there are other people in the world that, that mess up and they miss the mark and they blow it and yep. people get angry, people gossip, people do all this kind of stuff. Yep. And I'm like, look, like, don't let it kill you. Yes. It is dangerous. Yes, it has the power 
uh, to wreck a lot of things in your life, and it's already wrecking you. Yeah. But I'm not going to make it a heavy for you to come to this meeting as well and and feel like you're getting your rear end lift. Right. I, I don't want that. I want them to, right. to, to see the joy. And this Christ went to the cross for the joy set before him. Yeah. He was able to endure the pain and the agony of the cross along with our sin. He done them because he was able to keep folks on the joy that was set before him. And that joy was one day getting his bride, which is all of us. Yeah. I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. I can, I, one of the things I want to ask Christ when I see him face to face mm-hmm. is what was the joy set before you? What did you see? And I can only imagine his, his reply would be something. I saw your face and yeah. I saw Tammy's face and mm-hmm. I saw all these people who were going to have this major victory over sin and the devil along with me. And I was able to endure the pain and the agony and the brokenness of the cross because I knew that I was purchasing victory, not just for myself, not just against the enemy, but I was purchasing it for the whole entire world, past, present, and future. (laughs) And and if people can come to our meetings and find a joy that's set before them, well, then they can deny themselves. Yep. take up their cross, cr- literally crucify their flesh. I mean, Christ did it for us, right. but they can come into alignment with an understanding of that and say, like, wow, I can look at pornography as being absolutely worthless because what Jesus offers is so much better. Right. So yep. that's that's just the point I want to get across to people is stop the heavy, stop the shadows. You keep living in the darkness. That's where sin reigns. That's right. where the enemy stays. Amen. So you're staying in his camp where I want you to come out to the light. Yep. The more you expose this to people, it's hard. I understand you yep. exposing it to your wife or or your husband, and it immediately changes the dynamic of your relationship. Yep. And I understand that there are so many pastors, Tammy, who yep. are bitten by this bug of pornography, and they are addicted to it. And the one reason they don't want to share it in the pulpit is because they know they're going to be preaching to the choir when they say it. Yeah. And they struggle and struggle, but if they were to come out, what's the first thing that they're going to think of? Well, I'm going to totally lose my job, and then what do I do? Yeah. And, you know, all these yeah. pastors that have been found out because of Ashley Madison, yeah. the, the Internet uh, a phenomenon that took place last year where they exposed all of these names, and yeah. uh, a lot of pastors stepped down from their job because they were part of wanting to uh, secretly yeah. uh, be on the list to have an affair. Yeah. And somebody out and we 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 lost about four hundred good pastors that literally stepped down yeah. from their positions at their churches because they couldn't beat it, they couldn't fight it. Yeah. And I was a full time minister. I was a full time worship leader at a church yeah. who would go home and fail on a regular basis. Yeah. And I would just oh, I'd hate it. I'd watch it. I would self gratify, and I would drop to my knees and cry out for God to forgive me. And I felt horrible for days on end. So I know I'm speaking to people out there who have felt that up and down, up and down, up and down. You don't have to live it anymore. Mm. Oh, such a testimony. And you're you're making me tear up. It's just, it's, it's, it is a hard, hard thing. And, and, you know, it's something that starts out very natural for, you know, when, when my son was going through puberty um, and being autistic, we wanted to be sure that we covered everything with him in a way that he would understand. And, you know, we really touched mm-hmm. on things because there are things w- that are just, they're natural. It's a natural fact of life. It's a natural feeling. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's okay, but you need to also right. be able to control it, you know. And, and, and I think, too, in society, you know, everybody's so busy, and, and we think that the school is going to take care of teaching them what they need to know. But kids really need to be sat down and spoken to. I mean, it, even when I was growing up, it wasn't something that people wanted to talk about. My mom didn't share anything with me. You know, I was very naive and very um, left in the dark. And... I think it's important for us to start off with our young children and really educate them and talk to them and, and help them to understand the things and the feelings and, and the desires they go through and help them rein that in um, as a starting point right. for starters. But, I mean, your information that you shared is just so amazing. And I know that there are so many people out there hurting and struggling and 
afraid and ashamed, but you couldn't have nailed that any better because we all make mistakes of all sorts and of all kinds and of varying depths. But you know what? Like you said, God covers all of those sins and all we have to do is just ask to be forgiven and hold on tight and realize that he is the answer and that when we are feeling a void in our lives, it isn't because we need to go to Walmart and purchase the next best thing or that we need to get another fix. It's that we need to pull closer to God. And I've found that out over the last three years myself in just you know being sick and, and not being able to do the things that I normally could do. I just learned to pull tighter and the tighter I pulled, the more comfortable I felt and the more, the the less I needed, you know, he is everything. Right. And, and if we learn that early in life to just really see that the enemy's at work when he's causing us self doubt and causing us shame and causing us fear of stepping out of where we are, you know, to, to, to the, like you said, to the light and to the public and, and making this, you know, making it real and making, making, Bringing it forward is what's going to allow you to step over it no matter what it is, no matter what your struggle is. And, right. and having somebody to talk to is really huge. And, and I really think that your ministry is going to reach so many people, Reese. I mean, there, there are hurting people at so many different levels. <laughs> oh, there are. It, it's amazing. One, one of the things I, I, I want to say is... Um, I remember learning a little lesson about how those in Washington, D.C. or in the various mints around the area, yeah. um, in order to spot a counterfeit dollar bill, they study the real thing. I mean, these people learn what it means to look at the right dollar bill, exactly what it looks like coming out of the mint and authorized. Yeah. And then when they are, you know, brought in to see if something is counterfeit money or whatever, they can literally look at a dollar bill just with their eye and notice that it is a little bit off. It's a little bit different than the original or, or the authorized um, issue. Right. And and I thought, you know, when you were talking, this is the thought that came to mind when you talked about us starting to teach our children and show our children uh, in a way, what true love is, what real love is, yep. what intimacy is, um, you know, when yep. it comes to the things that they are able to see us do on a regular basis, whether we're sitting on the couch, um, you know, whether we're uh, out uh, you know, barbecuing on the grill and, uh, you know, the man walks up and hugs the wife and, and walks away or yep. gives a, a kiss on the cheek or, you know, or if you are sitting down and you're you're checking something out on the TV or something like that. You know, the man pulls the, the woman close. Yep. Kids watch that. Oh, yeah. They see it. We've been saying it for years, but people, you've got to know, kids are picking up on this stuff on a regular basis. Oh my gosh. If they see the beauty of it all, yeah. when they see the counterfeit out there, they'll want nothing to do with it. Yeah. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's what I'm hoping happens with the younger generation. If we can get these guys in time, we can turn them into a generation of people who love covenant relationship and covenant intimacy and pure holy intimacy uh instead of the perversion of it that's so awesome such a great analogy such a great great analogy and that's so true because our kids watch everything we do everything and and, mm -hmm. and i know it's not just my autistic son who sees every little small detail it's all kids <laughs> right. it's all kids and they see these things and and you know what it's it's only human nature to see us have our rough spots too you know we're not perfect and and the day to day like you said earlier you know day to day is not glamorous by any stretch um as, in comparison to the way the movies and the tv shows make everything seem but you know what the mundane when you can go through the mundane and still you know love that person and have fun with that person and and move on from the day to day and yes you have a tiff but you know an hour later you guys are hugging and going on about your day you know life is life and there's going to be ups and downs there's going to be valleys and mountains and it's it's working through and it's seeing that's the other aspect of it you know your kids don't miss anything and and, no, to, they don't. and to be able to show them you know that, that there are rough times and that's that's life like we try to really 
share that with our son that, you know, life is not easy. Life is not having everything handed to you. Life is going to be rough. And, and it's being able to know right. what to hang on to in the rough spots. And, 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 and like you said, I think for these young kids to be able to see the family dynamics, you know, we, we sit and we'll play rummy at night or we'll play, uh, you know, card games and dice games and whatever, but we do things as a family. And I think that today that is something that is, you know, not a norm anymore. Um, like you said, you grew up sitting at the table and eating as a family. We know when, right. you, when, when you have those family dynamics and, and you're close to your children and you keep your children close and keep them educated because society today is a whole different education than what you and I had. And, oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it is maddening. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I just can't imagine raising young children in today's world. I mean, my my baby's nineteen, you know. So it's it's kind of it's it's really eye opening, and just to to think and to know what what people could simply do to form a stronger bond and and keep things in check, you know. True. Well, it's cyclical, you know. Yeah. It's just like porn. And the viewing and the demand that you put uh, so that you can have it creates this global phenomenon of sexual exploitation and prostitution and things like that. Yeah. The destruction of the family that's been going on for years and years and years. It's not like families didn't always have problems and then suddenly they did. Right. But it's been more and more and more gradually growing, more destructive. Um, people, you're right, it's disposable. Um, they just go sign on the line and, well, it didn't work out. And But nobody, nobody really thinks about the children. They think like, oh, you know, it's okay. We're going to make sure that we, you know, love them and stuff like that. But the sense of what God created originally for it to be. Yeah. You don't recognize that something that's happening so deeply and emotionally in your life is you can sign on the dotted line and go your way and feel like, oh, I'm finally free of that stuff. But you don't recognize that on a spiritual plane, mm -hmm. you are now fragmented. You are now ripped apart from that other person. Yeah. And you have to find wholeness again. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then all of the decisions that you're making are going to be based on your fragmented soul. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to be looking for anything out there that will fill the void in your life. It's, you become a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And and God forbid divorce happens. We, we hate it. I've been through it because of my past and my just there's a whole other you know, iceberg. Right. Right. <laughs> I've only touched the tip of it. But <laughs> Right. I went. I went through a divorce and 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 recognized. I, I didn't even recognize fully then because it was about 15 years ago. I didn't recognize how fragmented I was and how much I was putting in my life that was just so counterfeit out there, just so I would feel better, so I would feel whole again, so I would have fulfillment in my life. And that, you know, it's just been the struggle ever since. Uh, Adam and Eve looked at the apple and took a bite of it. You know, it's a sense of there's something else that I can't have, but if I get it, it just feels so much better for some reason. Right. And 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 God wants us to have this sense of no, it may be the, the, you know that feeling of taboo you have. I, I, that's one of the biggest things. You know, when, when kids are growing up and they're dating and then they start to get curious in a sexual way right. and then it becomes all heated and crazy and you can't control yourself with that taboo feeling of what I'm not supposed to have, I, I want to get, you know, right. and, it, and it heightens the emotions and, and, and the passion and all this kind of stuff. We just live our lives like that on a regular basis. Yeah. That's the problem is that we're looking at all this stuff that we're, we're not supposed to get. You know, the other man just looks so tempting right. and I got to have her or whatever it is. We just live our lives feeling like we're victims, feeling like we don't have We look at life with the glass half full instead. I mean, half empty instead of half full. Mm -hmm. So we always think with the mindset of lack. Yeah. We don't ever think of the mindset of I'm a resource for this world. Yeah. I am who God has made me to be. And I have something to give to change it. Yeah. And, you know, if Jesus didn't have that focus, he would have never changed the world. Right. But any of us now in, in Christ, those people who have aligned themselves with what Christ did on the cross, now have the, the position to stand and say, I'm an investor 
yeah. into this world. I can give who I am and I can change lives and I don't care if I don't ha- have what looks, you know, like the grass is greener on the other side. I don't, I don't yeah. care if I have that. So what I have in Christ is more than enough. It's more than I will ever need in all eternity, yeah. what I have in Christ to feel fulfilled and feel like I have purpose and feel like I have joy. Yeah. And if we can get that, man, that can, that will cut the porn use like you've never, ever seen before. And it'll wreck this entire industry. Yeah. But there's billions of people who are, you know, indebted to it. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a huge job. But just like the Old Testament story of Maya, where he goes back to to Israel and he builds the wall of Jerusalem. Yeah. I can only build the wall where I am. <laughs> I can only make an impact where I am, but the impact that I'm going to make is going to be huge. And the wall being fortified in the area where it's at is going to be huge, at yeah. least in my neck of the woods over here. So. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. And it's so funny because I've been reading Nehemiah all week. And I think that is so funny that you said that because I've, <laughs> that's uh, just awesome. And that's, that's so, a great book. <laughs> it is so great. Uh, and it's, that's just so, you just gave me goosebumps. That's just really cool because that's exactly <laughs> what God wants us to do is he wants us for one, to be content in him and to build the wall where we are and make, make the effort where we are. You know, it may not be that we touch millions, but if every life we touch brings them closer to God, then we're doing what we're called to do. And, exactly. and, and everybody out there listening, you could be doing the same thing. You have a gift and there's something you can do, even if it's just, you know, loving your neighbor. But I, before I forget to ask this of you, Reese, what are some things that we, as the listening audience, can do to help people that are struggling with porn? Besides sending them to you, how can we, how can we help? How can we, how can we help? Well, you know, one of the biggest areas where people struggle is in their marriage. Okay. And I, I'm speaking to married couples right now. If you find out that your guy is watching porn and using porn to self-gratify, chances are it predates your marriage. And it's the hardest thing because wives, you will feel completely broken. Mm -hmm. You will feel as though you are not enough. You will feel very distrusting of your husband from that moment that you find out. And one thing I want to say is, look, not every guy has this. Okay. So don't look at your husband and be all suspect about it. (laughs) But, but if, if, if we could right now, before we know anything, if we could recognize something in ourselves and say, God, you know, if you are, if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ, look at your life and say, if this comes up, I'm going to need your help, God. I want to create a safe haven for my spouse who, who gets discovered in this. Um, Don't, it it is the hardest thing to do. And I know a lot of people sometimes get offended when they hear this because the natural reaction is to say, you have done this to our marriage. And what I'm saying is there's a lot of things that can be done to wreck a marriage. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just porn. Now, right. it's huge because it goes to the very core of the individual that you're married to. Right. It goes to the very core of disrupting the covenant of what you have agreed to do with each other, right. especially when it comes to sexual uh, sexuality and intimacy. But if we can choose to recognize something that God is able to carry us through it in his grace, yeah. and we'll be able to create a safe haven. So the first thought I want people to have is not, we have to dissolve this marriage because I can't take it. Right. Um, why, like, I've walked through divorce and I've walked through what my ex-wife had to feel. And I have felt that later in life when I became so aware of her brokenness after everything that happened with me. Right. Um, so I know it's bad. I know it's bad, but our choice should be to follow God's desire for marriage. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And if, if we can do that and we can continue now from this moment on to strengthen our resolve in him and our relationship with him so that he will keep us strong, if that ever presents itself, then the marriage can survive and it can be a symbol and a sign to other people who are going through broken marriages. Mm-hmm. If, if Christians will get through the tough times whenever porn rears its ugly head and it plays havoc and wreaks havoc with the relationship, mm-hmm. but you beat it and you both become closer to Jesus because of it, you can be that which people hold on to. Right now, Christians are falling apart in their marriages equal to the world. Mm-hmm. But what, what does the world have to look at to say, I need hope? And and if Christian marriages can do that, then then it, it's amazing. It's amazing what will happen. Yeah. Um, choose to work it out. For other people who aren't married, but they have other people in their life that, that are going through it, what I can tell you is don't let it shock you. Don't let it shock you. Don't sit back and go, oh, my goodness, you're involved with that? You know? Um, <laughs> Yep. Just come to the place where you understand you are broken without Christ, and yep. other people are doing things that they're doing because they're broken, yep. and they don't have Christ, or they haven't dealt with the issues of their life. Um, that keeps them in this place of feeling like they need this. Yep. We are all broken without Christ. The yep. Christ died on the cross to heal us. So don't get shocked. Yep. Continue to work now from this moment forward to recognize that you need the strength of God to be able to handle it when it comes into your life. Yeah. Very good words. And, and just to be a support, you know, this is in my opinion, in my opinion and in my view, it's a sickness. It's, it's, it is. And, and it's, and it's it's not going to go away. No, and and it's it's not going to go away overnight. Yep. And so you're going to have to answer the phone at two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you're going to have to listen to them tell you, I blew it again. Yeah. You're going to have to, you, it's going to be one of those things that over and over and over again. But if you make it part of the journey yeah. of becoming closer to Christ, then the more the times that you fail will start to become less yep. than the times that you're victorious. Yep. And and it is, we just need to be a support. We can't shun people for what they've been involved with. Look, there are millions and millions of people who are subject to this right now. Yeah. So it's starting to come to light. And it's only touching the tip of the iceberg right now with what's going on and what really could be, uh, what really could have the light shown upon it. So um, gear yourself up to be a good friend. Gear yourself up in the grace and the strength of God to be the best spouse you can be. Because if it breaks, you still have the chance to be victorious over this. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? I look at life that way as a whole in general, because men and women view things very differently. And, and for you men out there that may have a woman that's involved in this, you know, men and women exactly. view, view life differently and, and to be a support to each other is so huge because we stress over different things and just t- to know that we have somebody in our lives that we can depend on and go to and that they're our rock next to Jesus, you know, it's so huge. And I'm so grateful that I have a good Christian man in my life. And that is my rock. And, you know, we've, we really have built upon that. And, and it's so important. It's so important to just be a support, regardless what it is you're going through, whether it's financial debt, whether it's porn, whether it's anything is to be there for each other. And one thing I always do is when I have to speak or that I'm asked to speak, I pray that God gives me the right words because, you know, human nature, we, our tongues don't always say what we, we, we should. And, you know, when you ask God for guidance, he always helps. He always, always he does. helps. He, he's amazing. He does. And that's the one thing that you need to, the more time you spend in the word, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting that in you and let, like Paul said, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Well, the word of God goes in you like a seed, just like Jesus said, like seeds scattered among thorns, scattered on good ground, whatever. Yes. Let your, uh, it, it, is an, it is an amazing sentence that you can make from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible about mm-hmm. um, breaking up the fallow ground of your heart and allowing the word of God to dwell in you richly as it goes in like a seed. And as you fertilize that and as you stay close to God, the wisdom of your life increases. And you are able to speak into situations with the Word of God. Yeah. And that wisdom that goes out of you into that situation 
has effect. It has the ability to change the atmosphere around you. It has the ability to change the hearts of people who are going through the tough times. Mm-hmm. So stay in the Word. Mm-hmm. Stay talking to the Lord, not just in prayer on your knees by the side of your bed, but right. when you're driving down the road or yeah. when you're taking a walk out in the woods or whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. Because communication with God isn't that, you know, crazy prayer that the 80-year-old prays, you know, back in 1940. Oh, yeah. uh, our great and mighty gracious Redeemer, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, praise God. It's it's, mm-hmm. it's a sense of just regular communication, communication yes. with the Lord. Yep. Yeah, it's just talking <laughs> with God and saying, yeah. look, I'm ticked about something, or look, I, I give you all... You're amazing, God. I love you. You know, it, it it doesn't it doesn't have to be this authoritarian type of approach to talking with God. Jesus told his disciples when they asked him, "Well, Lord, teach us to pray." He said, "Okay, here we go, uh, Daddy." And that's the first thing he starts off with. Yep. Is you know, our Father who is art in heaven, but that's how King James translated. But it's translated, "Abba, Father." Yeah. Our daddy, who's in heaven, yeah. you know, you're holy. You're set apart from everything. Mm-hmm. You're you're amazing. You're pure. You're righteous. Like, it's incredible who you are. Just just go and talk to them. The same thing you would say to your husband or wife when you're looking at them and you're just so stunned by how much you love them. Yeah. And say that stuff to God. You know, yep. God, you are beautiful. You are drop-dead gorgeous, man. I can't wait to marry you one day, you know? <laughs> I mean, because yep. that's what it's coming down to, right? We're going yep. to be the bride and... Yep. And, and I don't do it enough. I admit, I don't do it enough, but I do. I do talk to them and things that come into my head. I'm just like, God, what, what do I do about this? Or, or I'm just hit by how wonderful God is. And I tell them how wonderful he is. Like, you want to feel that too, right, Tammy? You want to feel your guy. Oh, you? my gosh, yes. Like, Absolutely. And holy it's... cow. Look at this woman, man. Like, I do this to my wife all the time. And Paris is all the time. Like, look how good looking my wife is. She's like, oh, you know, she turns red, thousand shades of red. But later on. That's money in the bank because she comes back and she'll say thank you for doing that. <laughs> like, yes, I get embarrassed when I do that, but just to know that you feel that way about me, it is amazing. Yeah. And and so that's we can have that with God. That Absolutely. gets cool. Like Absolutely. enjoy God. Absolutely. Well, and you just you just triggered a huge thought in me is is that, you know, you are for those of you out there that are addicted to porn and you're struggling, you know, the more you pull closer to God, the more he becomes an addiction. And it's an awesome, right. awesome feeling when you feel uh, that you is. have lacked communication with him and you are just craving time with him. I mean, it's just an amazing feeling. God has carried me for the last year. He's carried me all my life, but he has really carried me this last year. And it's just been amazing. Right the growth that has come from it, both in me and my family and, and just that addiction. I want that addiction. I want that overloading feeling that I need more of him. And it's just an amazing, exactly. amazing thing. <laughs> well, there's the, the, the picture and I'm going to put a slant on this, the picture of the footsteps, you know, the, the, yes. the uh, yes. known footsteps. Yes. And it was, um, and, and so, you know, there's two sets of footprints and then there's another one where he says, uh, there's these, this long line in the sand, this, this huge long <laughs> line. Um, and, and he goes and he asks God, and he says, well, there was two sets of footprints back there, but I see there's only one set of footprint, but there's this long line. And he goes, that's where I drug you kicking and screaming. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and I think about that, but that's how faithful God is to us. Yeah. You know, we don't even recognize the faithfulness of God. Right. We always think, well, I can just stop it and uh, whatever. But no, literally, God is so passionate for us. He yeah. wants us to learn more of him. He wants us to know more of him. And if we would do that, we would recognize how worthless. I, I, I'll close with this. Um, I was reading the Bible one time, and I'm always into etymology, like uh, like the origin of words and stuff like that. Right. And I was reading this one passage of Scripture. I think it was in Isaiah. And it got along to the place where it said um, uh, the evil. The word evil was in the passage. And so it had a little you know, number by it, a little notation. So I went over into the, the middle of the page, and I saw that the word used for evil was also translated worthless and we can Hollywood evil out all we want. You know, you can have, you know, the, the lady with her head turning around like the exorcist, you know, and spitting all that pea green soup. And, (laughs) and, and you can think evil is the horned person and, and people eating flesh and all this weird stuff. But, but the bottom line is everything that's evil is just worthless. Yeah. 
That's it, awesome. It's completely worthless. It, it's not even worth the hour or the the three seconds. Like, if we're talking about porn, it's not even worth the three to five seconds you give to it. Like, literally, it is empty and void of anything that brings you life or joy. Mm-hmm. Whereas God is the complete opposite, and he can rescue the porn addict. I just need people to know that. Mm-hmm. This isn't about managing your porn and feeling like you are overwhelmed by it until the day you die. You can walk completely free and healed of your porn addiction. It does not have to define the future. Just because you did it, it's not who you are. You need to be and speak over your life that you're a child of God, that you're a prince or a princess of the Lord Most High. And if you start doing that, princes do things a lot different than other people, like normal people do. I say normal people, but <laughs> princes act in a different way because of their role in the kingdom. And if we can start to do that in all humility, just like our King Jesus came down and was very humble and a servant to all, if we live our lives like that, we will have a different identity and a different purpose. And I tell you what, if you live the identity of the Prince of God, you will not dabble in pornography and you will not want to dabble in pornography. Awesome. Awesome. Reese, this has been an amazing interview and I know that we will be reaching so many people and there's so much to take away from this. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share this with my audience today. Thank you so very much. This was, I know, on a very oh. personal note for you, but thank you so very much for sharing your story. Oh, not a problem. My life's an open book. Anybody wants to talk to me about it, or uh, you can contact me through those websites. Any, anybody has anything to share with me, I'm open to uh, communicate with them in any way I can. That's awesome. That is awesome. And again, folks, you can find Reese Crane at the silentaddiction.com and also at lovebeyondourselves.org. And again, you can find that in the show notes. But I just really appreciate you all taking the time to listen. And I, I pray for all of you out there that if you are struggling, that you find goodness in this um, podcast and that you seek out Reese because he is really has a great ministry going on and and I just pray that you will be able to step out of the shame and the mask and and find peace and happiness in your life and again Reese thank you so much for sharing your time with me today and everybody thank you oh, thank you for having me you are most welcome and everybody thank you so much for joining us and until our next show you guys take care And God bless. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where you will learn something new every week. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to join us at TreyerWilderness.com. And be sure to connect with us on iTunes. Remember, your reviews on iTunes are very important to us and help us reach more people just like you. 